Welcome back, everyone. Well, I'd say I'm at about 50% operating capacity right now. I've been pretty sick the last several days. Pretty much been laying on the couch. Um, that's why you haven't seen much from me, uh, content on any of the channels. But I'm back at it today, and everybody's been telling me, hey, there's a new Checkmate link tonight. you got to check it out. So I'm going to do my best to get through it. It's 36 minutes long. So either I'm not going to talk a lot or this is going to be a two-part reaction today. Uh, ready to cheer on the USA. I just finished watching England uh, stick it to the Iranians in a big way. They're looking really good. They're my picks to win it all, so we'll see what happens. As always, the link's in the description, not only to the original content for this video, but also to my reactions to all of At and Shea Films, other content that I've done with that whole Checkmate Lincolnites series. So let's go ahead and dive into this one today. Slavery. The war was about slavery. <laughs> God damn it. How is this even possible? Is it the school system? Is it your home life? Oh, come on. I was into that. That disgusting film is nothing more than Yankee propaganda. History is written by the victors. And now through political correctness, today's media are rewriting as those of us with common sense know as true history. Now, history is written by the victors. And there's some great examples of how things tend to get rewritten by the victors. I, I've mentioned recently a perfect example. I just came back from a tour of the sites associated with the Battle of the Bulge. And, you know, the aftermath of World War II was all about punishing war crimes committed by the Germans and the Japanese, uh, while conveniently overlooking the occasional war crimes committed by uh, the Allies. Uh, so that kind of stuff does happen. But in this case, the, the war was about slavery. We've established that. We're not going to fight that one again. Well, that's a bunch of baloney, and you're living proof of that. Millions of people around the world believe that the South seceded in the Civil War because of states' rights and taxation. And through most of the 20th century, many Americans even regarded antebellum slavery as a relatively benevolent and humane institution. And I don't know if you remember, but you guys lost, like, big time. You got your asses handed to you. Simmer down. Your asses were surgically removed and physically placed within the grasp of thine own hand. <laughs> All right, that's enough of your cheek. That's pretty good. This is serious business. In elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, we all learned that the Civil War was about states' rights and all the reasons behind the war. But then, not too long ago, the narrative changed. And suddenly the Civil War was 100% about slavery and only slavery. Literally nothing else. I've literally watched history be rewritten in front of my eyes. You know, it does happen sometimes, the revisionist history thing. But in this case, it was a correction that needed to be made because generations of people were being raised with the whole South will rise again thing and states' rights. And yes, states' rights was a part of it, but it was the states' right to own slaves. Uh, you know, I, honestly, just anybody who spends five minutes researching the Civil War can take a look at the secession uh all of the, the secession documents, all of the um, gatherings that were done at the state level. Listen, we've talked about this ad nauseum. Why individual people fought the war was different than why the government seceded. The Confederate government was built 100% to defend the institution of slavery. Now, it's not to say that the North didn't still also have slavery, and that that's not to say that the North was fighting the war to end slavery, it wasn't. It was fighting the war to reunite, you know, to preserve the Union. Slavery became a war goal later on, but, uh, uh. But I suppose you think I'm just being ridiculous. No, I, I think you're right. The Civil War history is absolutely being rewritten. Check me to the fixed. Canats. <laughs> <laughs> History is always being rewritten. True. That's how it works. Yeah. Historical hypotheses are made to be challenged and questioned as others bring attention to different evidence or come at the issue from illuminating new perspectives. That's true. You know, I mean, there are times that hundreds or even thousands of years afterward, we can make a new discovery, some new document, some new thing that helps us re like understand things in a different way. Now, it's important to note that it should be harder to do that the further we get away from an event. Uh, 
if if new evidence comes to light, it should be weighed against what we already know, and we shouldn't completely rewrite everything we understand. It should be added to what we already know. That's right. There are always two sides of history, and both need to be heard even if you disagree with one point of view. Well, I think there's a hell of a lot more sides of history than just two. There are as many different perspectives on the Civil War as there were people who lived through it. Yeah, but true. But not all perspectives are valid history. Some narratives can be misleading or even outright false, and for a historian to parrot them uncritically out of some misguided sense of inclusion is just really fucking irresponsible. What you Fair. consider to be the southern side of the story of the Civil War is literally just lost cause mythology. The lost cause isn't a valid point of view on anything. It's just a collection of factually incorrect claims. It's not a question of perspective or interpretation. This stuff is just demonstrably wrong. Says you! And what exactly do you and your cronies consider the lost cause myth? Because from what I've seen in your channel, anything that doesn't depict Confederate soldiers as bloodthirsty villains is lost cause propaganda. What you are calling the lost cause myth is so unbelievably broad, it could encompass essentially any unbiased review of the Civil War. Now, I don't know where he's going to go with this, but that statement by this Stonewall Jackson is not wrong. I've gotten the impression from him that anything that doesn't depict uh, Confederate soldiers as bloodthirsty villains is lost cause. Uh, I've gotten that impression from him, so I'm curious to see how he's going to respond to that. Oh, I'm referring to something very specific when I talk about the lost cause myth. Essentially, it's a pro-Confederate belief system that emerged from the post-war histories of the White South. Its seeds were planted during the war itself, as Confederates tried to solicit international sympathy by distancing themselves from the cause of slavery for which they seceded, but really came to the fore in the 1880s and 90s, when ex-Confederates began a systematic campaign to sanitize their reasons for secession and paint their actions during the war in the best possible light. Seems far-fetched to me. Now, everything he just said, I'll agree with. The problem is, I don't get the impression from him sometimes that that's what he's calling lost cause. It, it seems like, like he just very narrowly defined it. And I agree 100% with his definition there. But I've gotten the impression, especially in the video about gods and generals and things like that, that he's really widened that definition of what is lost cause. To me. What, so former Confederates just rewrote history within living memory and yeah, everybody they just did. went along with it? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, they did. That's crazy. Is it? It's true. I mean, look at what's been happening in recent American history. No matter what side of the political divide you're on, I think you would confidently say that the people on the other side have deceived themselves into believing a narrative that's completely divorced from reality. Yeah. Amen, brother. At least with the lost cause, there's a grain of truth. Like, if you squint at Civil War history and cock your head, you can kind of see it. But today, I mean, shit. Remember the gay frog guy? Lots of people were totally on board with the gay frog guy. People crave meaning in their lives. People desperately crave meaning, and myths can give it to us. Well, I say there was no lost cause. Stay rats! Well, let's look at some of the evidence. Definitely was lost cause. As we cause. talked about before, defense of home and hearth was not the only reason Confederate soldiers went to war. Defense of slavery and white supremacy were also powerful motivating factors. Agree, but there was also a defense of slavery and white supremacy in the North. Not to the degree, and it wasn't kind of a political aim of things, but yeah, he's right. And a significant number of them said as much in their diaries and letters. Oh, gracious, this again. And I suppose this is where you bust out her racist quote. I literally have a whole duffel bag full of them. Uh, okay. Pick a quote, any quote. <laughs> the Vandals of the North are determined to destroy slavery. We must all fat, and I choose to fat for Southern Rats and Southern Liberty. Lunsford E. Andale Jr., Staff Surgeon, 4th Tennessee Envy. Now here's the funny thing. In April 1861, the North wasn't trying to destroy slavery. The North had slavery. Uh, so it's an interesting perspective to see a Confederate soldier worried about defending slavery. Now, granted, the South breaks away over an issue that wasn't necessarily being fought because they were kind of looking down the road. Remember, the entire uh, 
last 80 years of politics in the United States has been this balance of slave state and free state. And when the slave states start to see the possibility of the free states and the abolitionists maybe getting more influence and more power, they were very proactive in seceding because they were afraid that it was going that way. Even though the Republican Party, Lincoln you know, is the first Republican president, and he says, no, I just want to keep it from spreading. But in the South, they saw keeping slavery from spreading to new territories as the first step in the death of slavery itself. Okay, April 1861. Another one? Where are you going with this? You'll see. A stand must be made for African slavery, or it is forever lost. William Grimbo, 1st South Carolina Artillery, November 1860. Another? This country without slave labor would be completely worthless. We can only live and exist by that species of labor, and hence I am willing to fight to the last. Now. It's important to balance that with the fact that there were plenty of common soldiers who didn't own slaves and weren't really fighting for slavery, who did see it as a defense of their homeland. And you can pull out plenty of quotes from soldiers saying the same thing, that they were defending their home. They were defending from northern aggression, from invasion. But he's making a great point that there were plenty of common soldiers who were fighting this war over slavery. William Nugent. 28th Mississippi Infantry, September 1863. Let me top you off there. Lincoln declares the blacks entitled to all the rights and privileges as American citizens. So imagine your sweet little girls in the schoolroom with a black woolly-headed Negro and have to treat them as their equal. William Garner, 10th Arkansas. Now, I will say this. Plenty of people in the North didn't want to see uh, freed slaves treated as equals either. Uh, this was a, a common concern by Northern soldiers as well, uh, especially Northern soldiers in slave states like Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, uh, Maryland, the southern part of Illinois. Cavalry, January 1864. Refills are free. I will show the Yankees that a white man is better than a that's a bad word. Jonas Bradshaw, 38th North Carolina Infantry, April 1862. And that guy was just a private, a poor farmer. Well, let's do one more, just because we're having so much fun. It is liberty or death with me. I love home and all that surrounds it as much as anybody. But if I have to be the equal to a nope, 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 nope. I had rather never come home. Better me fall in the struggle for it. Will McKee, 18th Georgia Infantry, September 1861. Jesus. There's a lot more where that came from in the duffel bag, but I don't want to belabor the point. We've covered this before. So, during the Civil War, many Confederate soldiers expressed very strong pro-slavery sentiments. But decades after the war, they changed their tune. In Sam Watkins' famous Confederate memoir, Company H, written 20 years after the events in question, the author plainly stated that, We believe in the doctrine of state rights. They in the doctrine of centralization. We only fought for our state rights. They for union and power. The South fell battling under the banner of state rights, but yet grand and glorious, even in death. Weird, right? Or we can listen to the 1947 audio interview of 101-year-old Confederate veteran Julius Howell, which has gone viral in a video posted by the eminent historian Black Confederate One, and is often touted as definitive proof that Confederate soldiers did not fight for slavery. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. Now, friends, it was a great curse on this country that we had slavery, and I thank God that I did not bring up my boys and girls under a system of slavery under which I was brought under. What did you boys fight for then? For states' rights. For states' rights. And it wasn't just the soldiers who were saying this stuff. 
the men of the upper echelon of the Confederate government, former plantation owners who, in 1860, had shouted from the mountaintops that they were seceding to preserve slavery, seemed to suffer from a severe case of post-war amnesia. Yeah. So said Jefferson Davis in his memoirs. Slavery was in no wise the cause of the conflict. Yeah, he, he's making this point quite well, that there is a tendency to revisionism in the post-war years. And it's in that same time period that a lot of these statues go up that have been fought over in recent years, uh, which is what complicates that whole issue. But um, can't argue with any of that. There, there was definitely an attempt to revise why they were fighting the war in the years afterward. And as former Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens argued in 1868, The conflict on this question of slavery was not a contest between advocates or opponents so that which is especially hypocritical for stevens because he's the one who gave the cornerstone speech i mean he gave the most well-known speech of all arguing that the war and the secession was all about slavery so what changed what happened the lost cause happened look after 1865 material conditions in the rebellious states were dire Southern wealth had been reduced by 60% down from pre-war levels, caused as much by Confederate mismanagement as by Union invasion. Half of all their farm machinery was inoperable, the railroad system was in ruins, and what little industrial capability they had was utterly destroyed. These factors had a dramatic, negative impact on white Southerners' quality of life, and the humiliation of defeat was psychologically devastating. In their personal correspondences, many Confederates wrote frankly about their experiences of despondence and hopelessness after the surrender. Many fell into a spiral of anxiety, depression, and alcohol abuse. Yeah, but a lot of them also fell into anger and wanting revenge on the people they felt were responsible for this. And that's why you see the rise of the Klan and the rise of a lot of these white supremacist groups and just these awful, awful things that happened in the post-war world. And this is why you get the occasional very misleading and very wrong statement that black Southerners were better off as slaves because at least they had their lives and at least they were protected. I understand why people make that argument, uh, but it's just a way of getting out of, of recognizing that the former slave owners just started going after these people in revenge. And now, you know, now at this point, because they don't own them anymore, there's no value to keeping them alive so they can show how they really feel about them. And that's where you have these just vast numbers of murders, uh, just horrible, horrible things that happened to the freedmen in the South. The imagery that pervades their writings were of death and darkness, gloom in the tomb. With the power of the slaveocracy forever shattered, ex-Confederates of the plantation class would soon have to jostle for political power against a whole host of highly motivated new rivals. Upcountry unionists, white yeoman farmers, Afro-Creole elites, and Republican freedmen. And all these other Southerners had something that ex-Confederates distinctly lacked. A story a unifying mythology that defined them as a group and a people. In 1865, what was the Confederate story? Rebels, failures, slavers, traitors. As an early leader of the United Confederate Veterans put it, If we cannot justify the South in the act of secession, we will go down in history solely as a brave, impulsive, but rash people who attempted in an illegal manner to overthrow the union of our country. It was a fate worse than death an eternally dishonorable reputation. Something had to be done to avoid it. Ex-Confederates needed to improve their self-image. Less than a year after Appomattox, one Georgia newspaper predicted that the victory over Southern arms is to be followed by a victory over Southern opinions. Ex-Confederates were determined to control the narrative. And almost as soon as the guns went silent, they rushed to write and publish Southern-centric histories of the war between the states. Seems they were right to do so. The time proved that newspaper man right. 
Marxist, Maoist, mainstream historians have made it their non-binary mission to shove a plant-based civil war narrative down our collective throats. What? Descendants of the Confederacy take pride in their ancestors and should be allowed to honor them as New England and other regions honors their ancestors. But the Confederacy has been unfairly disparaged by today's cultural genocide that is also degrading the Founding Fathers and other once esteemed aspects of American heritage. Now I will say this. I don't have a problem with people taking pride in their individual ancestors. I have a few ancestors who fought for the South in the Civil War. And I can honor them without honoring the cause they were fighting for. Um, just like, you know, I know it's a very complicated thing for a German and, you know, German family today, for example, if they had a a grandfather or great grandfather who fought in the Wehrmacht. It's very difficult to honor your relative who maybe died for a terrible cause, died fighting for a terrible thing, but still died fighting and maybe wasn't necessarily in support of that. So it's complicated. I don't like how this is worded because they are defending the Confederacy when trying to defend ancestors. And I think that those are two very distinct things. Well, you're allowed to honor your Confederate ancestors, just like you're allowed to buy truck nuts. You're free to do these things, they just make you look like a fucking asshole. And cultural genocide. Jesus Christ, you're a drama queen. But he's I disagree with them that it makes you look bad to honor your Confederate ancestor. Like I said, it's just a difference between honoring the ancestor and honoring what they fought for. Is that term not apropos for the Reconstruction Era sound? We had failed to achieve political independence, but in undertaking to write our own histories, we began a fight for cultural independence that would become an enduring part of American life. What? It's very uncanny how you go from just totally insane to completely reasonable at the drop of a hat. It's just profoundly weird. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The first major offensive of this cultural war of independence came in 1866, when Edward A. Pollard, the wartime editor of the Richmond Examiner, began publishing his war histories, most notably The Lost Cause, a new southern history of the War of the Confederates, which is probably the origin of the term. Rabidly pro-slavery before the war, Pollard went on to become a Confederate true believer and a tireless evangelist of the southern side of history. In his books, Pollard did not deny that slavery played a role in secession, but tempered his analysis with white supremacist apologia. The occasion of that conflict was what the Yankees called, by one of their convenient labels in political nomenclature, slavery. But what was, in fact, nothing more than a system of Negro servitude in the South, one of the mildest and most beneficent systems of servitude in the world. This claim was still pretty close to the wartime. Yeah, we had slaves, but... It was like the best form of having slavery anywhere in the world. Okay. I'm Confederate party line. At this early stage, the exact tenets of the myth were still unformed. But very quickly, more and more Southern histories began to deny that slavery had had anything to do with secession, instead fixating on more defensible motives like states' rights, libertarian government, and anti-industrialism. The first issue of the Southern Historical Society papers, an influential lost cause periodical, indicated a subtle but definitive shift in Southern historiography. The late Civil War, which raged in the United States, has been very generally attributed to the abolition of slavery as its cause. But a close study of the history of the times will bring us to the conclusion that it was a fear of a mischief far more extensive and deeper even than this, which drove cool and reflected minds in the South to believe it was better to make the death struggle at once than to submit tamely to what was inevitable. All right, so that one I don't entirely disagree with. Uh, and again, what complica complicates this whole thing is that the North and the South at the beginning of the war had very different motivations for fighting the war. Uh, and I'm talking about the governments of the North and the South. The government of the South is very clearly defending the institution of slavery. Uh, the government of the North is saying it's not about slavery at all. It's about preserving the Union, keeping these states from seceding. The, the war aims progress as things go along. And so he's talking about here 
uh, has been generally attributed to the abolition of slavery as its cause. And so there he's talking more about the northern aim, which it wasn't about abolishing slavery. Uh, and then he's talking about you know the idea of submit tamely to what was inevitable. I believe that that's absolutely true. You know because nobody in 1860 was talking about abolishing slavery. Nobody was talking about that. I mean nobody in any position to do anything about it. There were certainly people who felt that way. They're abolitionists, but the South probably very much did see this as an issue of we better fight for it now or submit tamely to what was inevitable. I do believe they saw it that way, that the election of Abraham Lincoln, the election of uh, this new Republican Party, them having control of Congress as well, was the, the first step toward an inevitable abolishing of slavery. I, I'm sure they saw it that way, and so they were going to break away now before they were in too weak a position to really do anything about it. Totally true. Had the South permitted her property, her constitutional rights, and her liberties to be surreptitiously taken from her without resistance and make no moan, would she not have lost her honor with them? If the alternative were between such a loss and armed resistance, is it surprising that she preferred the latter? Lost Cause writers paid particular attention in those early days to rehabilitating the reputations of key Confederate leaders. So I, I, I disagree that that last one was Lost Cause. I think that was a pretty accurate observation of what things were about some of the other stuff definitely is leaning lost cause and i'm sure that some of what he's going to present still will be as well especially robert e lee no one was more instrumental in this than lee's old division commander jubal early who published the first book-length memoir of any civil war general late in 1866. drawing on experience from his years as a lawyer early began a campaign of ideas that was so scorched earth it would have made sherman blush his histories defended every last aspect of Lee's generalship, and when any historian dared to disparage the old hero, Early viciously attacked them in print. For decades after the Civil War, no one ever took up a pen to write about the conflict without living in mortal fear of Jubal Early. Oh. Yeah, and that's true, and if you can just look at how Longstreet was vilified in the years after the war, especially when he wrote his memoir late in life. Uh, because he dared to question some of Robert E. Lee's decisions, and that was just an absolute no-no. Old Jube simply wished to defend General Lee from the defamations and detractions of ignorant persons. Concerning the Battle of Gettysburg, for example, he set the record straight. Some said Mars Robert was responsible for our defeat. Imagine that. It's nonsense. It's General true. Longstreet, bless his heart, failed to carry out Lee's order to attack at dawn on July the 2nd. If he had attacked promptly, we would have carried the day and won the battle. I doubt it not. Well, there's only one problem with that, which is that no dawn order was ever given. Yeah. As far as anybody knows, Early made that little factoid up. At least. And not only that, but I absolutely question the whole notion that the South winning Gettysburg changes the outcome of the war. It doesn't. Vicksburg still happens out west, and the Union still eventually brings its might to bear. There, there's no scenario that doesn't involve European intervention where the South wins that war. It just isn't happening. Lee's birthday celebration in Lexington, Virginia in 1872, and a lot of Confederate veterans who had been officers at Gettysburg were kind of baffled by it. But Early kept repeating it and writing about it. And William Nelson Pendleton, Lee's old chief of artillery, dutifully propagated the lie in his writing. It would become so prevalent that it was part of most histories of the Battle of Gettysburg until well into the 20th century. But what possible reason would they have to fib? Well, because Longstreet had quarreled with Lee, and Longstreet had been right. After the war, he publicly criticized Lee's leadership, so he was high on Jubal's shit list. Yep. Not to mention he famously became a Republican yep. and worked closely with the Grant administration. To yeah, he became uh, the U.S. minister to Turkey in the years after the war. Help enfranchise freedmen during Reconstruction. Yep. Wait, so when I call him a scalawag, I'm basically just saying that he didn't completely hate black people? Yeah, that's more or less the historic context of that word. A scalawag is a white southerner who doesn't completely hate black people, and a carpetbagger is a white northerner who doesn't completely hate black people. Oh, yeah. Well, then why didn't Longstreet try to defend himself, huh? If he was so blameless and innocent. He did, just badly. Yeah. His public retorts to Early and Pendleton were ponderous and tone deaf and full of sloppy misstatements of fact. 
and only made him more unpopular, and his inaccuracies gave lost cause evangelists an opening to shred his credibility. You call these historians evangelists like the lost cause was some sort of religion or something. <laughs> well, it kind of became one in yep. a way, especially after Reconstruction. In the 1870s, the tenets of the lost cause consolidated themselves into a coherent mythology. Slavery wasn't a major cause of the war, states' rights, tariffs, whatever. Lincoln was a tyrant slash northern aggression. The Confederate army was completely badass, and Bob Lee was the perfect man. Sherman was worse than Genghis Khan, and the Union <laughs> army was full of rapers and pillagers. Bas and see, basically what you're doing with this stuff is you're taking things that have elements of truth to them, and then you're making them extreme, right? So... Was Robert E. Lee a great general? Yes. And so you take him from being a great general to being the perfect general who could do no wrong. Did Lincoln do some things that could be argued were tyrannical and he bent the Constitution and kind of probably went too far with his powers? Yes. So you take that and you just make it a little more extreme. Were the Southerners fighting over the state's rights to determine whether or not they had slavery? Yeah, so you make that simply state's rights and not slavery. Were tariffs an issue? Sure. Were they the issue? No, absolutely not. So you just kind of push everything to the margins. Man, Sherman was worse than Genghis Khan and the Union Army was full of rapers and pillagers. Basically, the stuff you and I have been talking about for years now. Black people and everybody up north still thought this stuff was pretty bonkers. Union veterans organizations were particularly outspoken in their skepticism and disgust, but it came to be widely believed in the White South. And just as people congregate in churches, temples, or mosques to worship their god, Southerners congregated at reunions, funerals, and monument dedications to reinforce their cultural myth yeah. through ceremony and ritual. Oh, come on. These were veterans' reunions, not the black sleep of Kali Ma. Uh, these events were just soldiers hanging out and reminiscing. What's the big deal? Oh, but it was so much more than that. These were profoundly meaningful events for these people. And that's true. And, and it was true in the North, too. It's, it, it's actually really cool to be able to read um, a lot of the unit histories, like regimental histories, will include speeches that were given at... Uh, dedications of monuments and at reunions and things like that. And then in the North, you know, it was very much talking about their their glorious cause and what they were fighting for. And so I've not really read any of the Southern ones, but I'm sure they're no doubt very similar to that. And the level of reverence on display was over the top, even by Victorian standards. The ecclesiastical aspects were overt. Southern religious leaders had been among the most vocal secessionists and later became some of the most passionate lost cause evangelists. Sermons delivered by these men were a mainstay of post-war ceremonies, blending evangelical Protestantism with the emerging theology of the Confederate Redeemer Nation. Reverend J. William Jones, a wartime chaplain, Baptist preacher, and key contributor to the Southern Historical Society papers, typically began his prayers with the words, O oh God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Israel, God of the centuries, God of our fathers, God of Jefferson Davis, Robert Edward Lee, and Stonewall Jackson, Lord of hosts and King of kings. A bit much. Like any other religion, the lost cause had its pantheon. Lee and yeah. Davis, having suffered for their people, were identified with Christ. Stonewall Jackson, long-bearded and wild-eyed, syncretized with Moses. Longstreet, that errant disciple and betrayer, was Judas. Yeah, and you look at uh, you know Stone Mountain down in Atlanta. Who do they put up there? Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis. Um, I'm going to wrap it up right here. I, I don't want this to go too long. I know it's kind of right in the middle there, but we're going to pick this up tomorrow with part two, and we'll kind of react to the rest of this. But let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And like I said, you can check out some of my other reactions to the Atten Chase stuff in the links uh, down in the description. Thanks for watching.